We'll give maybe just a just another minute here before we get started. Um, Jen and I are going to be talking about nine different tools, strategies, approaches um, to sort of streamline things you're going to need to do: grading, classroom management, email management, so on. And we're going to go through those nine pretty quickly, um, just to give you an idea, and then. Uh, give you an opportunity to to go look at and learn how to use uh, any one or two or three that you have time for today. And then again, this resource will be available to you later. So if you don't get to something today, um, you can certainly come back to it um, in the coming days as we go through. Um, <coughs> Jenna, do you want to uh, make it a uh, presentation? Thank you. Yeah, so we've got nine different things to look at having to do with email and uh, oh heck, all sorts of different things. So what we're gonna do is just sort of go through them. And like I said, this is a real quick overview. We're only gonna take like maybe two or three, maybe two minutes for each of the nine, just to sort of show you what what's possible. And then at the end, uh, we'll share this slide deck with you and you'll have a chance to follow uh, a link to learn more about how to do any one of these things we're going to look at. So this is the menu we're going to be covering, a uh, calendar to-do list, uh, some different types of calendar things, grading, emails, and things like that. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I think I have the first one. What is it? Whoop, we lost it. Can you let me take over? Yeah, so that you could share the, I stopped sharing so you could. Yeah, because I will have to go somewhere, won't I? Uh, where is it? This one. There we go. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes? You want to make sure. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is talk about a calendar to-do list. Um, and it, you all have Google calendars. If you manage a team, you have to try. You all have, Monday sorry. A platform to track everything that's Doesn't want to be quiet. There we go. Going to skip those ads. So let me show you three different ways. Um, this is linked to a video because this guy, and this is the one I think is linked to in in the um, in the practice session that comes at the end. And um, this guy talks about different ways that you can use your calendar, which you all have, as a as a form of a to do list. And um, there's lots of different ways you can do that. I don't know how much you've used your Google Calendar before. But using it as a to-do list is one really easy way to sort of keep track of what you have to do. Um, he talks about three different ways of doing this. And one is to create all day events in your calendar. Those are those green ones you see up here as a way to just put down the things that you have to do today, not particular time. And what that allows you to do is to see how busy your entire day is. So for example, on the left-hand side here, um, there's three things that have to get done that day and nothing scheduled for the rest of the day. So you should be able to get those done. Now this one, he might have too much to do so you can slide this over. And what that allows you to do is to treat your entire day or your entire week as sort of something you need to do. That's a form of a to-do list and it also uses uh, Google Calendar functions to send you reminders of things that you want to do. Another way to do a to-do list that he'll talk about is to actually create a calendar itself called to-do list. And so this calendar, which you can create, is reserved simply for things that have to get done. And so when you have, you know, five things to do on a certain day, you put them in there and you, you link them to a to-do list calendar, a calendar just for those purposes. And that allows you to sort of keep track of those things because you can turn calendars on and off and you just want to look at what I have to do today. You can show just that one thing very quickly. And then there's one other type of uh, to-do list function he'll talk about. And it's using something called reminders. And these reminders is an actual type of event. When you create a new event, you can either create an event or either an event or a reminder. And what the reminders do is they show up, as you can see here, a little bit differently. And they also 
move along. So if you don't cancel them, if you don't say, yeah, I did this on Monday, it will move to Tuesday. And so it will remain on your list of things to do until you say, yep, I did it. Now, this is just one way of sort of managing a lot of different things that you have to do in your daily life. And it allows you to use a uh, Google Calendar, which you already have access to and you may already be using um, to help you do that. And if you have questions about that, save them because I'm I want to turn uh, the next section over to Jenna to talk about Calendly, which is another type of calendar uh, that can help you do that. Do you need me to unshare and you share yours? I think it will let me stop your screen sharing. Okay, so Calendly is. Um, an app that I intend to use for students to be able to schedule office hours, but at the elementary level, I would imagine it's basically will create a public link for anyone to be able to schedule a meeting with you for a designated amount of time. So parents, um, if you wanted to make yourself available for parents in the evening, they could um, I just have the free account and I just found out about this probably a week ago from Kelly Hume. So I was able to go in and set up with the free account, you get one meeting type. Um, I'm not sure what the cost is for the more extended version, but I didn't see myself needing more than one meeting type. So I set it up as a 20 minute meeting and I set my availability to, for our student schedule to asynchronous times. So between 8 and 10 a.m. as well and between 1 30 and 3 students could schedule a 20 minute block with me and I set my availability myself. I hadn't gotten to Friday yet and updating that and one thing that's really cool about Calendly is that it integrates with my Google Calendar so I'll show you what it looks like from the scheduling point of view but because I have a an event in there for the staff meetings this afternoon it actually won't schedule anything past 12 30 because that shows us something that's on my calendar. So even though I didn't set that for today because there was an event on my Google calendar, it knew that. Um, and then I was able to set what I wanted people to, what information I wanted from them when they scheduled a meeting. So I would need the student's name, their email address, whether they wanted to Zoom or call. And then if there's anything specific I should be planning for, it will add a calendar invite to my Google Calendar automatically. And that is, was just up at the top under um, calendar, it's like calendar connecting, I think. Calendar connections, yeah. And when they confirm their meeting, there will be a link to my personal meeting room for Zoom. I also envisioned emailing that out to them though. So then, the actual meeting itself is, um, I was just going to post this link at the top of my Google Classroom and they can pick whichever days I have availability. So it says there isn't anything available for today. That's because I think I said it so they can only schedule a meeting two hours in advance and you can change that to whatever you want. Um, but if I wanted to schedule it's time on me Monday at 9 a.m., I would confirm that time, would ask for my name, email address, phone. And if I schedule the event, um, it sends a calendar invite to the student and it will also show one on my account as well and I can show you what that looks like um, and it will, here's the link to the Zoom meeting. So then if I go to my account on Monday, it shows that, it, it shows me, but it would show the student's name um, at 9 a.m. and so we would both get a reminder. So that is one tool that it was new to me, but I envision being pretty useful. There's a link here with more information on Calendly setup. 
And then it looks like Google Keep is the next one, which is also me. Were there questions in the chat I need to address? If you have questions, you can shout them out. I, the chat is not coming up for some reason. Hey, Jenna, this is Ashley. Um, where did you put in the Zoom link? Because I've set up Calendly, but I didn't see a place to put in the Zoom link. So on the confirmation page, I was able to add a custom link and I could title it whatever I wanted. And then I just added my link to my personal meeting room. Since that's what I envisioned, I would just open up that room rather than a custom meeting each time. So is that, can, that won't be a meeting that actually is recurring on the Zoom. It's just a meeting that you, you'll open it whenever you need to? Yeah. Okay, because I was looking at doing recurring meetings and it'll only take you through till October, but I thought mm -hmm. you could reuse the meeting, um, the same code every time you want, right? It doesn't expire. I think with your personal meeting ID, you can reuse it every time. Um, uh, can I jump in there? I asked that same thing, Ashley, and Kelly Hume was telling me that instead of doing the reoccurring meeting, if you just set up a meeting office hours, you can go back and use that same link over and over and over again. That would work okay. too. That's what I was just saying. Okay, got it. Okay, so on to Google Keep. And Google Keep is also something we have access to. It's just in this little, um, whatever you call this, the waffle or the grid. Um, and it's this little light bulb post-it note thing. It's also an extension you can add to Chrome. And I have the app on my phone also, which I like to be able to save things that I come across. But I use it as a to-do list. Um, and so you can, I just made little headers for the different aspects of my life that I was going to need to do lists for, and it will show me what I've crossed off. Um, I use it also, and this is where I think it's helpful to have it on my phone. I don't like to fill up my bookmark bar up here with links to come back to. I don't, I, for some reason I can have 50 tabs open, but not have my bookmark bar cluttered. Um, so I'll put like resources that I come across either on different websites that I'm at or um, on my phone and I can save them all to my Google Keep and they'll just generate links here that I can come back to whenever I need to. You can also use it to set reminders. Um, so there was, I had a reminder today for productivity tools. Um, if I wanted to have a reminder to complete the screening form, it I can set it by location also. Um, you can add, so when you're taking a note, um, you can add collaborators to it. You can show check. So if you wanted just a note without check boxes, that's fine. But if you wanted to show the check boxes and create a list, you would just do this drop down menu here. Um, you can add pictures to it, which is how I got these in here. And then I have my like reoccurring to-do list that I'll continue to add to and subtract from pinned so that they show up at the top, but the other ones will be down here so they aren't getting in the way of that. And then, so just another option for to-do lists. Peter, is it your turn with self-grading quizzes? Sure. So, so do you have to add the, the extension keep? That's something you have to add? You don't have to add the extension in order to get to keep. If you wanted to save a link directly from your browser, then you would add the extension. Does that make sense? So you can still, you can use keep as a to-do list without the extension. But if you wanted to save links or URLs from different pages to your Google Keep automatically without having to copy and paste those, then you would want the Google Keep extension. Okay, so um, that Google Keep is really cool. The first time I ever saw it, I thought, eh. And the more they've added to it, the more I've seen it used. It's pretty. I want to go follow those links that Jen has provided because it looks like something that would help me quite a bit. Um, and because it's a Google product, it also inter integrates really nicely with everything else that we're that we're using. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about a grading uh, function that many of you might know about. I'm going to go through it really quickly here, just in case you don't know about it. And, and um, you can spend a lot of time on this um, if you wish. There's links below. Um, but this is how to create a self-grading quiz in Google Forms. And just real briefly, you create a form and a quiz. Um, here's a question. What is today? And this, you share this out and someone can answer however they want. Um, but to turn it into a quiz, what you're going to do is you come up here to the gear icon, um, which is all your settings. And here's where you can click on a tab that says quizzes. And you can turn this any, any form at all into a quiz that will do self-grading functions. And there's a lot of options you can use for it. Um, the first thing I'd recommend is that you always collect email addresses. So if you're doing this with the students, that whoever is logged into the computer is the person filling out that form, right? And so that's how you collect information for that. So if you want to make any form a quiz, the first thing you do, come to quizzes and click make this a quiz. And it gives you lots of different options. Now there is a locked mode on Chromebooks. Um, I have not used that, but what it says here is that if once the student opens up the quiz, they can't open up other tabs, so they can't go researching it. Personally, I wouldn't use this type of quiz for something that's, you know, highly secure, especially in our current environment. You can certainly do that. I use these a lot of the times just for feedback and formative assessment. Um, and we can talk about why I wouldn't use it that way later. But um, basically, there's a couple options you have. You can have the, the score sent back to a student immediately when they submit. Or you can turn something on where they won't release the scores until you release them. This might be where uh, in our current environment where the kids might get the, the quiz uh, at the beginning of the week on drop day and you want to give them till Thursday to take it, you might not want the correct answers going out on Monday. So you can, you can control that. Um, and if you choose that, it's a little bit more complicated, but not a lot, uh, but just have some, uh, a couple more steps to do later on. You can also choose what the responses are that the students get. Do they do they get to see which questions they missed? Do they get to see the correct answers? Do they get to see the point values? So you click on this and save, and then what you're gonna be able to do, oops, I missed it. Um, then what you're gonna do, once you click on that save, what you've seen, there's a, there's a change here. It now says at the bottom, answer key. So um, if you click on answer key, this is where you can assign how many points this particular question is worth, and you can also choose the correct answer. Now obviously, this isn't a very good question for that because tomorrow they, they get it wrong. But that's all you need to do. And now this particular uh, form has turned into a quiz where when a student fills it out, if they make the selection correctly and submit it, uh, it will tell them, hey, I got 100%, nice. Um, or if you've selected to delay that, I'll do that and just show you what that looks like. When they submit it, they'll say the response has been recorded. It does not show them their score. It doesn't give them that option until you release them later. Now, that's the back end thing. It's not complicated, but it does take a few more steps and I wanna move forward um, through the other options. So if you're interested in using Google Forms as a quiz, either for immediate release or for later release, um, there's some tutorials and some information you can work on a little bit, or I can certainly help you through that at that point. But I also want to talk about another grading feature that's available to you through Google Classroom, and that's using Google Rubrics. And again, this is something you might be familiar with, but in case you're not, let me walk you through it real quickly. If I go into my Google Classroom uh, and I have, uh, there's my class, test classroom, I have a new assignment. Um, one of the things I can do with any assignment is to create an actual rubric. Um, so if it's not a you know yes no question or if I want to add something to it, there's a button down here where you can create a rubric. And when you create a rubric, you're going to have um, a, a, a criterion, something that you have to score, and you can describe what you mean by that here and how many points it's worth, and um, what you might call that title. They get three points is excellent. And then maybe you want to provide them one, what's, what's two points. 
um, whoops, needs work. Zero. You can do as many as you want, obviously. Um, it takes your highest point total, puts it over here. You can have another criterion, um, attractiveness. I'm not gonna worry about typing correctly <laughs> at this point. And this can be the same or a different point value. Maybe this is worth more, and this one's only worth two and whatever. Um, and it adds up the totals as you go. Now, when you save that rubric, it is actually attached to that assignment. And as you see down here, the rubric shows up two criteria, nine points. Now a student can click on that to see what they're gonna get scored on. So if you've included descriptions of what you're looking for, that can guide them through the activity. Um, it's a really nice way to assign something. And then when you're scoring it, it's really easy to do too. I don't, I don't have a student version to show you right this second, but basically when you open up an assignment to score, the rubric will be right on the side and you can just sort of click the, the score each one gives you. You can add private feedback for each component or for the assignment as a whole and, uh, and help the kids get to where you'd hope they'd be uh, as they go through that. And again, the instructions near the end of the um, near the end of the slideshow, which we'll get to in a minute, we'll walk you through that. Jenna, you're up. Muted. Sorry, muted. Um, I'm going to show you Google, the comment bank in Google Classroom. So I just created a couple of assignments um, just for practice and assign them to myself. And this was, um, Um, I just, I, from a different account, just hit turn in without actually doing anything, but on this assignment, I, which presumably we had students do that too, I'm hoping there's less of that this year, but on the piece where I asked them to show their work, um, you can see it's blank here. So I found myself oftentimes repeatedly saying that I couldn't give you full credit, you didn't show me your work, please submit your work or email it to me if you would like to receive full credit. And rather than typing that each time, the comment bank, which is this um, comment with a bookmark over on the right hand side, um, gives you the option to copy and reuse comments. So there are a couple ways you can do that. You can either add to the bank up here um, and just type your comment that you're gonna reuse repeatedly or if you wanted to comment directly on the slide, you could say, um, and comment that. And then if I click the more options, I could add this to the comment bank. And then um, the same thing happened on the student's other assignment. I could go back there and do the same thing if it loads. So I could um, start adding a comment. And if I just start typing um, submit, so if I use the hashtag or uh, depending on what generation you are in, um, the freeform comments will pop up. Um, so I could just say, please attach or email your work so I can give you full credit and I don't even have to type out that whole thing. The other way to do it would be, I could just copy these. So if you select the copy over here, um, I could paste that into the comment bank. If you prefer to leave um, private comments on the student's work rather than on the individual slide, it won't pop up with the free form. Um, you can, it won't just like complete your sentence for you. You will have to go to the comment bank, um, copy it, and then go down here to the private comment. And um, and then post that. But that still saves you a little bit of time in terms of retyping the comments each time. And those are not assignment specific. So 
you could, um, I, I was routinely saying like, you, you did not show your work, please show your work so I can give you full credit and grade this. And I was able to use those on the full range of assignments that I was assigning. All right, what's the next one? I think it's- Did you get one more, are you done? I get one more, oh, out of yeah. office email. Okay, so from email, go up to settings, down in, under general, but down towards the bottom, there is this vacation responder. And I, I think it will depend on the buildings, but we were told that when we are taking a sick day on distance learning, we'll need to set up an out of office response so that students and parents or whoever else were, would be emailing us would know that, um, were out sick for the day and would not be responding to emails. And if they needed to get a hold of anyone, um, leave the office phone number. So this would be the way that you do that. So you would turn on your vacation responder. You can set it for, you could schedule it in advance or if you wanted to, another way you could use this, which would be a little tedious, would be um, setting it for weekends if you were planning on not responding to emails for the weekends. You would have to, like every weekend come in and set it up so that it started on Saturday morning and ended on Sunday. And then you would have to go in and do that for the next week, but you can set an end day. And then you can, um, you can set a subject line, which would probably say something along the lines of, then your message would be down here and you could say whatever you needed in your email if it was, if you were anticipating it would be mostly students emailing you, you could direct them to your Google Classroom for help for the day or a website. Um, I would probably include the information for the school so they could get in contact with the office if needed. And you can set it to either send to people who are in your contacts, which is probably not what I would recommend, or people who have a wise Hammond Valley Schools. So that would apply to students and staff, but if parents were going to email you, they would not get this out of office response. So I would probably not check either of these. And then you could save those changes and it will automate an email whenever one comes into your inbox. I'm sure you have received, the district office usually sets them up. Um, so I would imagine. Jenny, you said that was building specific. Um, in terms, I know that's what we're doing for sick leave. I suspect that each, I suspect that most buildings are going to recommend that you have an out of office um, notification, but I think it's building specific, like what the protocol for taking a sick day is. Yeah, because that's the first I've heard of that. So, where did you get access to that, Jenna? Was it under the wheel? Yep. So, here I'll go back in not saving my changes. Yep, under the wheel and just under see all settings. And it's almost like all the way down, it is all the way down at the bottom under the general tab. Okay, I got, I think I have two more and then we're hopefully gonna give you time to process some of this stuff. Um, so, oops, that's not what I want. Um, I want to share. I want to share this screen. Um, the next item on here is Gmail filters. And I'm, I'm just going to show you really fast how to set them up and why you might want to, and then move on to the last one. Um, and the tutorials for both are, are pretty good. Um, this is my inbox. Um, sometimes I'm proud of it. Sometimes I'm kind of ashamed. Um, I got a lot of emails over the last couple of days and, um, creating filters is one way that you can sort of wrangle your inbox to, uh, make it understandable to you. And that's a lot of, uh, emails to look at, but it would be a lot worse if I hadn't set up some filters. So a filter is a way for you to use, uh, a particular feature of an incoming email to do something to it. And as you can see here, I have one here that says calendar next to it, and one here that says school. Those are filters I've set up so I can identify them quickly, and if I wanna move them, deal with them, or do something else, um, I can 
they catch my eye very quickly. And it's really quite easy to do. Um, I know I got a lot of emails from Libby this morning, so I'm gonna use her as an example. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this um, email I got from her, and under these three dots, I'm gonna go to filter, filter messages like these. And it says, okay, are you talking about all emails from Libby Childers? And if that's what I wanna filter, I'm gonna say yes, and I'm gonna have it search. And it's gonna search for all the emails from her. And, I'm sorry, I gotta go back to that. Um, uh, I had created, I'm sorry, create a filter is what I wanted to do. There's the filter. Now it says, now what do I wanna do with those things? Well, um, for anything from Jerry or my principal, I star it, because I want those to stand out. Or maybe I want to, um, apply a label to it. Maybe I want to apply the label school to it. And you can see down here, I've got that school label is all attached to it now. Or maybe I don't want that label. Maybe I want um, whatever I, I can come up with or I can create a new label. Maybe I'll just create one called Libby and um, I'll create that. Um, and then I'm gonna create the filter and if I go back to my inbox, and it worked right, and I'll put a school one on her. Um, let me try it one more time. Uh, I'm going to go here, filter message. I forgot one step, I think. So I'm just going to search for all of them. And once it finds them, one more time. I'm going to create that filter one more time. And um, once I've created that filter, I know what happened. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, let me just, I'll just put on boomerang just for the heck of it to see if it works. Um, for some reason, it's not working. Although if I go to my boomerang, all the Libby ones should be there. Nope. Okay, so I'm, I'm skipping a step. I'm not gonna try to figure out what it is, but basically what it allows you to do is take incoming emails and sort them uh, for you. Well, the, the school one seems to have worked because all the Libby ones now have school on them. And one of the options is skip the inbox. So if you know you get emails from someone that you want to look at from time to time, but you don't want to have them clutter up your inbox, you can do that by uh, making that selection in the filter. I went through that real quickly. I also didn't get it to work quite right. So I'm going to let that sort of uh, self out there at the end while you practice with that. I do want to talk about email templates because it's a really useful tool and then uh, we'll give you time to work on it. Um, in my email, if I go up to the settings cog here uh, and click see all settings, one of the options I have over here is called advanced and under advanced you have some options and if you do this you're going to need to enable templates. And what templates are is they're much like the comment bank that Jenna was talking about in Google Classroom. These are emails that you send out over and over and over again. Um, you send out uh, emails to students asking them to complete an assignment or you send out a, an email to your advisory or homeroom teachers just checking in, see how things are going. Um, they're canned responses that you can call up anytime you create a new email. So if I wanted to the email Jenna with something that I send to a whole bunch of other people, I can come down here to templates and put in an automatic, a pre-written template email and send it off to her. And rather than having to retype that email over and over and over again, the template allows you to, to create it uh, and to reuse it as you go. Um, so that's the template, Google template feature here Either. and what we've hang on just a second let me just put this here because I want people to be able to to move on and I'll answer questions um, this is the last slide in the slideshow we're going to share with you right now and what I'd like you to do if you have questions hang around and 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 share them but if you are ready to go uh, off on your own to try one or more of these things out for a few minutes the link is right there Jenna posted it too it's a slightly different link but it should take you to the same the same place. So feel free to uh, move off. Um, if you don't want to listen to the conversation in the Zoom room, then go ahead and leave the Zoom room, but do come back at about 10.50-ish, which is only 15 minutes. I know it's quick, 
um, but come on back and we'll wrap things up and we'll see what questions you might have. I'll be quiet now, stop sharing and questions, you got them. Peter? Yes, do yes. You do, this is Monica, do you yeah. go to, um, this is a really stupid question, but like how do you set up groups? Like if I wanna send a, a email to all my parents, I don't know how to set up just the groups. I tend to copy paste email addresses. I have not set them up for a while um, because they changed some of the um, some of the application or some of the capabilities of it uh, through through our filters. But I would imagine you're going to go to Google Groups. I just went over on my Gmail to the the dice symbol, the three dots by three dots, and down here at the bottom is groups. And uh, am I sharing? Not sharing my screen, am I? Let me share my screen then. Uh, one more time, I'm in my Gmail and I go over here to the right and click on Google Apps. I find Google Groups is an option. If you're if you don't see groups there, um, you can find it a different way. You can under, go underneath the apps here and maybe find it there. Um, you can also probably go groups.google.com, which is how you find just about any of their tools. <laughs> um, so now I'm into groups. There's an overview if I want to create a group. Hmm, I don't have permission to do that. And again, I think, I think that's, that might be a Jeff and Rhonda thing um, because it used to be pretty easy to do and then because of some of the changes on the back end um, it might have been restricted um, so you might you might start with them Monica I, I, that might be the best way to go if you want to create a parent group or something like that now are you using seesaw you'll be using seesaw all right yeah or, or yeah. google classroom seesaw right yeah. um, I don't know what the capabilities are within that google classroom has a way where you can have parents of students log in and then that becomes an email group that you can use. Yeah, I, 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 I tend to just copy paste, get everyone's email address. Yeah. And still send out emails. Chris Fister's, Chris Fister's saying in the chat, you can do it through contacts and I have not done that. Oh, Tarna has to. So, um, so they are your experts in that direction. Fister and uh, Tarna. Uh, any questions about any things we covered? There were a couple questions in the chat about creating the templates. Like, how did you get the original Jenna, you, or not Jenna, but you need to turn in your missing work. How, how to create that template? Yeah. It's, I I could not find a good video that that wasn't overwhelming and just covering way too much, so I made one. It is in the it's in the shared resources on that last slide. And um, <clears throat> that should take you to, I think it's six minutes, um, and watch you through it. So I'd recommend that. Hey there, everybody. Uh... Um, and, and if it doesn't work, if that doesn't do it for you, let me know. I'm, I've got the office hour in the next year, in the next year, oh my God. The next hour, <laughs> the office hours for a year. Uh, next hour, I have the office hour slot. So if you give that video a try or anything else and come on back, I will, I will walk you personally through it. But I think the video will do it. All right, no questions. Awesome. Hey, Peter. Uh, I was just not sure where those. Um, emails end up, how do I find one after I've created it? Uh, one of the templates or one of the filters? Well, after I've made one, uh, you showed us how to make one, but then I didn't know where to find it if I want to use it again. Okay, so once you have a template created, anytime you go to compose a message, you come down here to these three dots and templates should be an option. And all the okay. templates I have available to me. You're not screen sharing. Okay, thank you so much. I did an entire class last uh, spring um, doing exactly that, and none of my kids told me that my screen was not being shared. <laughs> Thanks for speaking up. Anyway, <laughs> as I was saying, when you go in, after you've created a template and you compose a message, 
an option down here next to the garbage can is more options and templates will be one of your choices. And here's where you simply call them in. And, okay, thank you. and so it just pops up. And in the video, I point out, if you have an automatic signature line, um, like a lot of us do, I think it's a great thing to have. Just make sure when you create your template, you don't include it because the template will put in your signature line and then the new message will put in your signature line and you'll end up with two of them. So I just changed this template. I'm now gonna go up here to templates and um, save draft as template and at the very top here it says overwrite. So the template that I just created here as a demonstration, I removed the signature lines. Now I'm gonna overwrite the old one, save it. And if I now come in and do that happy birthday one again, there should only be one signature line because it's not adding a second one. Yeah. So if you make a template and then you wanna change it, you can do that. This one apparently I included the person's name. So you don't wanna include the person's name, you can add it, right? You can add, a, um, you can add to whatever's in your template. But if you put someone's name in there, in your template, then it'll come up every time. So they're kind of generic, but you can tailor them before you send them out. Did that answer your question, Betsy? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Jenna, I'm going to have to look at your Google Keep resources because that's way better demonstration of why I would want to use it than what I've seen before. But that looks. It's, I I have tried to use it a couple of times and I'm horrible. Like I'll start using a planner and then quit, or start using a to do list and then it gets too overwhelming and I don't keep up with it. So really, I've tried to use Google Keep well a couple of times and I think organization piece of it is key. and for me I do a like a good amount of work on my phone also so the fact that I can use them on both um if as long as I'm diligent about using both I think will be helpful for me yeah and do you I see you can set deadlines and reminders and things on that do you interact with um google classroom too or a calendar because calendar, calendar I don't know I have not used the reminders as well as um or as much as the to-do list piece because there's a plug-in on google calendar for keep interesting on, on the right side if you're going to google calendar i have okay yes i have seen that Where so over here so here's my calendar and over here is a plug-in for keep um and so i imagine it would it would bring up at least a limited version of that see because i have a couple things in there so let me see if my notes come up yeah i just don't know how how much it integrates but they usually do it looks like at this point only my notes are showing up and not my reminders which is interesting mm. but i'm wondering well let's see i have reminders on Yeah, it doesn't look like it's adding them to my Google Calendar. I feel like there must, I'll have to look into that. I would imagine there would be a way to get them to integrate more easily. Peter, are you going to um, give an updated tutorial of how to do filters for email? Did you say you were missing something? Oh, I was trying to zip through it in this demonstration and I missed a step. But the video I linked um, is accurate and it does a really good job of it. I, um, 
I don't know why mine wasn't, I, I could try it again right now, actually. Um, yeah, let's try it again. Let's, let's filter all our Zoom messages. These are all the messages from Zoom. So what I'm gonna do is, am I sharing my screen? You need to share. I'm gonna get better at that. Can you see my screen? My, in my inbox? I think I'm sharing it, yes, okay. So I'm gonna click on this Zoom message and I'm gonna say um, filter messages like these. And it's gonna say, you mean all the ones from no reply at zoom.us? It usually uses the, re the reply to address as the filtering feature, but you don't have to. You could, you could put in, it has the words attendees. A lot of these say your meeting attendees are waiting, but not all of them. So I might only want to filter messages from this address that has the word attendees. Um, the video I show you will say, this is a really good way to sort all those um, mailing lists you might have subscribed to, and they show up and say, I don't have time to read that now. You can uh, try filtering, if I spelled it right, unsubscribe, all the messages in your inbox that have the words unsubscribe in them because most of those mailing lists will give you an option to unsubscribe at the end. So if I search for this, it's gonna find all the messages that say I can unsubscribe from. So you can have all kinds of different filters. Where did my Zoom one go? It disappeared. Uh, here, I'll just search for it. So, uh, Okay, so here's my Zoom. Let's see if we can make this filter work. I'm gonna click on Zoom. I'm gonna say filter messages like these. All the ones from Zoom I wanna search for, okay? It's already, it's already found them, so I'm gonna create a filter. Now, I want all of these Zoom messages to um, have a label. And I'm gonna create a new label called Zoom. And I can put it in a certain place, so I can nest it under school, for example, and hit create. And at the very bottom, it says, you also want to apply that filter to 24 other conversations that you've already received. So it's going to filter all the new Zoom messages coming in into this filter, but I can also apply all the ones that I already have, which I always do, and hit create filter. Now, if I go back to my inbox and I find those Zoom messages, you'll see it now has a filter on it. It's called school slash Zoom. And every one of those ones from Zoom is gonna have school slash Zoom on them. There's another one. Now I can also, uh, change this filter coming over here, it's under school. So if I come down here to school zoom, I can change the color to be something that sticks out. Um, I can also change, um, uh, I can give it a sub label if I want to. Um, I can keep it out of my inbox if I wish. Um, when I set up the Zoom filter for school.zoom, I can change that filter to include, uh, to, to make it skip my inbox. Um, keep in mind that if you have something that's automatically gonna skip your inbox, you might be less likely to see it. So I would only have things that do that if they're like, well, okay, I've got time to go through all my, um, all my articles from Edutopia now, and they're all in my folder called Edutopia, and I, you never see them come in. Um, they're all just hanging out there. Um, <clears throat> but so, so to set up that filter, the easiest way to do it is to choose one um, email that, that is like what you want filtered. Click on filter messages like these, 
make sure that whatever it's using to choose those messages is what you want to use. Create a filter. This one, maybe skip inbox. And I'm going to apply a label. Um, I don't know if I already have one. Maybe I'll create one called um, um, newsletters. Peter, while you're typing, I just came in. What does skip the, the inbox do? Um, if when I get a message from teaching American history, which are that from this one, I just set it up. So whenever I get a message from this email, it will not show up in my inbox. Okay. It will go straight to the place that I told it to go, which is newsletters. Yeah. So I want to, I don't want to unsubscribe. I like the stuff from time to time, but I certainly don't want to wake up in the morning and find 50 newsletters that I have to put, right? So I, it's a way to sort of divert it, but I, I'm really careful with that when, because it'll take it off your radar, you know? Um, well, we're out, almost out of time. I, I'm glad I made that filter work. It, it really does work. I think I'm, you have to sort of think things through. Uh, can you have more than one? You can have tons of filters. Every one of, if you look at my inbox, um, 3D Game Lab, Admin, ASB, Boomerang, Calendar, Home, those are all filters. Those are all filters or folders. And um, so, like I said, I anything that comes from Craig McKee or, um, or Jerry, in there somewhere, or Brian Morris, my administrators, I or Nina, our head secretary, it, it gets a star. That's a filter. And so if I ever want to find something from Craig, um, I just click on the star. That's the first thing I always do because I know it's going to be here. Um, and so starred is, is the top filter underneath your inbox. Um, but that's what it is. It's just a filter. So if there's someone that you never want to miss their email, you never want to, you know, skip it. Um, that's one of the first filters I'd set up, which is to set it up to be starred. Um, and so every time I get an email from my principal, it comes in with a star. It's really easy to see. And it's also filtered, uh, goes into the starred uh, section after I've read it. Peter, I will also, I did some looking at Google Keep and I just didn't have the reminders calendar on, which is why it wasn't well, my keep reminders weren't also showing up on calendar, but they do integrate pretty seamlessly. So anything I add as a reminder in keep will also drop into my Google calendar. Great. Well, we're almost out of time. I don't know if everyone made it back. I think people did. Um, and uh, I know all day long, same thing. There's, there's not enough time to to actually do all these things. What we're really hoping to do is introduce you to some of these things maybe you haven't seen or heard of before and give you an opportunity to decide which ones might be ones you wanna come and revisit and work with some more. Um, the video of this session and all the links and resources we've talked about will all be on the, the uh, professional development uh, website. Um, probably not today, but by Monday. Uh, they hope to be there. And so you can always come back and, and play around with some of these things a little bit more. Um, we're just about out of time here. There's one more session for you to choose from. And um, well, what are they? What do we got? Boom, boom, boom. One is engaging uh, slides, presentations, or lessons. There it is. Uh, yeah, interactive slides. Uh, Jenna and Amy, you're doing that. So Jenna, you got to get out of You got to go get ready for class. Uh, <laughs> It'll be tardy. And, uh, and then uh, increasing parent and family communication. And again, keep in mind, if you're going to those, just get to the slide and click on the Zoom room. It'll take you right in. Um, office hours are available. Also, I will be there. So if you want to continue work on any of these things or anything at all, I'll do my best to help you. Um, and if you've had enough of this fast paced stuff or it's just not addressing what you want, you might spend the last hour just exploring some of the professional development website. Any of these links will take you to a, a page dedicated to helping you learn how to use that particular tool. Just be back around noon. We'll tie all of it up and uh, do some uh, evaluations and get out of here uh, for lunch at noon. Um, 
especially if you're doing clock hours, you want to make sure you fill out that form because they're using that for attendance. And I believe there's also prizes uh, for some random prizes for people to fill out the form um, who are going to come up. I think we'll have those on Tuesday. So make sure you get that done before you leave today uh, for the morning session. So thank you for hanging with me, and um, I gotta get out of here and open the um, the cl the office hours. Um, so if you have questions, uh, if it's real quick, I'll take it. But otherwise, I gotta be out here like in two minutes. Okay. I'm gonna duck out. You Thanks, just Olo. Noon. Where do we go? Is there a, a Zoom thing or something we do at noon? Uh, we're just done at noon uh, with the morning session, and then your building has, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Um, I? I just thought you said come back at noon, and I was like, wait. I no, 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 no. You, you have one more hour, uh, one more session, and at the end of that session, we just ask that you come back to the main slideshow and fill out the review, uh, the, the feedback survey. Okay. Uh, and then what you're doing after lunch, I don't even know. I haven't looked that far ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. And uh, I'm going to kick you all out because i got to start another one. So we'll see you soon, I'm sure. Becky, I like your avatar, your picture. That's great. You look happy and refreshed and ready for school. Thank you. <laughs> I, I hope I feel that way. Yeah. We'll see you, neighbor. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.